So like Dr. Dishan said, we're going to talk today about um, programs. Um, we've, if you guys have been following along in our webinar series, we've talked about building a CV, building your application, the do's and don'ts of doing a, uh, writing your personal statement, and the next sort of um, um, step in the series is to talk about programs. So my presentations, I'm going to keep it short and pertinent so that we have time for our um, panelists and, and Dr. Hamid to talk as well. Um, but the presentation is just going to be split into two parts. The first one is going to be about selecting programs and how what to consider when you're thinking about a residency program for yourself. Um, and the second part is going to be um, a, a few do's and don'ts about communicating with residency programs. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so first of all, like selecting residency programs. So when you're building your program list, these are the programs, the residency training programs that you're going to be applying to. Um, the list that you use to apply to is built within the ERAS system. However, um, I'm going to focus a little bit on researching your programs before you start to build your list in the ERAS system. Um, so when to start is the first question. And um, if you haven't started already, like there's no time like the present. So if you haven't started already, I, re I recommend starting it now so that you are in the best position to uh, maximize your knowledge and make an informed decision about like the programs that you are applying to, what they need and what you um, what you need for yourself or you're looking for in a residency program for yourself as well. Um, some resources of where you can look for details about programs. Um, so the AMA has the um, uh, fellowship and residency database, um, with the, which is linked in this um, web um, in the presentation. Um, that's a really great resource of exploring residency programs. Um, includes like particulars about like whether they have any, uh, what their eligibility criteria is. The you can sort it by location. You can sort it by um, 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 states, um, and then also look at find like contact information for the programs as well as. Um, um, their particulars of, of the residents that they have in their program. Um, so I definitely recommend exploring the Freda database. Um, the second and important thing, once you sort of like build, uh, once you start to recognize which programs are in a specific area, you can go to the specific program website, which is also linked in, in for most programs in the Freda database, um, and really explore within there um, to get more details about um, what the program has to offer and what they're looking for in a candidate as well. And then the NRMP is also a great um, resource to look at in terms of where um, um, program specifics um, as you're researching programs. Um, so what are some factors to consider? You've, you've opened up the Frida database, you've picked one program, you're looking at their website. What are some factors to consider as you're looking at it? So the first, first thing to consider is like, does the program um, seem to offer what you are looking for in a program? What does it seem to line up with your career goals? So, um, for example, if you have a really great interest in like research, or if you are, are really interested in basic science research versus neuroimaging research, um, you're really interested um, in, in some of those things, does the program really have to off, uh, like focus on that or not? If you're really interested in psychotherapy, is there a psychotherapy training program um, or um, so, um, linked with it? Or do they off, is it a very balanced program in terms of balancing biological and, and psychotherapy treatment as well? Um, and I put a little star next to it because it is really important to consider what you when you're applying, especially as an IMG, and uh, sort of the, the goal becomes like I just want to match. But it's it, this is a good time to think about what you want in terms of your training and what your career goals are as well, so that you don't just stop at like I want I will go to any program that takes me, but really think about like what I am looking for in a program, and really like not shy away from applying to some of those dream programs that you may have the top tier programs um, as well. Second thing to think about as you're looking through those programs is, are, do they have any tracks that are offered? For example, like are, if you're really interested in medical education, do they have a medical educator track? Or if you're really interested in child, like does the program offer like a combined adult and child training program? Um, if you're really interested in like practicing in the community, is, does, is there a community psychiatry program or track that's offered there or not? And really a lot of this you're gonna get in the, in the, uh, from the web program's website as well. Uh, thinking about the setting of the program, is it a university-based program? It's, if it's a community affiliated with a university program, if it's a community program, um, think about like looking at diversity. So on the program website, you can you can most programs you can access like the current resident um, residence profiles, um, or at least kind of like look at um, at 
at sort of like the the different program uh, the different residents that are in that program um the percentage of imgs in that program um important to consider um for many different reasons like does the program have any experience um in um uh, with imgs um how well are they going to do if you um how well are they going to do in terms of like being able to look at your and and um um look at your and um evaluate your application um and then their um, percentage of IMGs is usually listed on the Frida uh, database as well. Um, but if you're looking in the individual program, um, current resident list, it, it lists kind of like where they where most residents graduated from. Um, so that's a good place to look as well. If you have a geographical preference for a place, so that's a that's a specific for a program to look at as well. If you have a geographical preference, that would be a, a specific sort of like filtering tool or um, at least prioritizing rule for uh, um, um, criteria for yourself. Um, other things too, and important things to look at sort of um, are the eligibility criteria for the program. And these are, are, are listed as, uh, in, in Freda, but also listed on the program websites as well. If they have any specific like cutoffs or average scores that they really uh, um, um, consider before letting applicants um, um, inviting applicants for interviews and reviewing their applications. If there's a year of graduation um, eligibility criteria or US clinical experience uh, um, eligibility criteria that they like really clearly outline. And then program policy around visas being offered. A lot of times it's not the individual um, psychiatry pro training program that has that policy. It's usually like an institution wide policy on whether they support H1s, whether they support B, um, uh, J1s, and whether they are or able to offer a new H1 versus just continue um, an H1 that you that somebody that an applicant already had. So that's an important thing to consider um, because if they don't, if the institutional policy is that they're not going to support a visa, the likelihood is is going to be very low that even if there's a stellar candidate, that they would be able to move um, the institutional policy on that. So that's a pretty important one to consider as well. Um, so. There's lots of factors to consider, but sort of thinking about where can you get some help? Um, who can you ask for to help and sort some of those things out? A really good resource is your peers. Everybody's sort of doing the search together. I know in some years, applicants have decided to kind of like pair up and make like the program list together, not an ERAS, but sort of like make a separate list together um, so that everybody divides and kind of like conquers that research um, aspect of, of programs. Um, people who matched within the last couple of years are important people to ask because they may know sort of like, especially if like some policy has changed, some people may have their own list that they may be willing to share. Um, and they may be able to like tell you kind of like which programs were like offering um, interviews and may be able to even like tell you a little bit about um, a, a program criteria um, as well. Alumni of your school, if your school has an alumni association, um, that's a great place to kind of like ask and get some help because they might be able to shed some more light on sort of like specifics from your school um, and kind of the programs that they apply to. Um, ECFMG has um, a whole um, page uh, dedicated to sort of how to research programs and and um, look through them. So it talks about a few um general things and also kind of like where where to look for as well and then the um, eras website has a residency explorer tool that really lets you um not just compare programs but also compare your own profile to uh, profiles of applicants who've matched in the last couple of years um i um i think that may be a cool place to kind of explore and see because it really like breaks it down applicant profile by and and matched uh, applicant profile by volunteer experience research experience and what's the mean number that that program sort of like had in the last year and they really are looking and are comparing profiles from 2016 to 2020 so it's like very recent data as well um so next step, sort of like building your list. You've sort of looked at the program, you've reached out to people to get some insight onto how to prioritize. I strongly suggest making a separate list on, on, on an Excel sheet um, or like a Google Excel sheet, whichever program you prefer or like, um, So building it in Excel um, is quite important because then you have like sort of a, a database of your own from which you what you're using to build it in ERAS and you've already researched your program. So building and saving the program list becomes a more efficient process. Things that I, I recommend including on that um, Excel sheet are like what type of program it is. Again, like the factors that you're considering, sort of putting them together in one place is a good idea. Tracks that are offered, contact information so that when you're 
contacting programs, you have one place to just kind of like go to and get the contact information to, uh, to, to write to that program. Again, any cutoffs or any eligibility criteria that they have, any year of graduation requirements, what sort of USC requirement uh, do they have? How many LORs do they want? Because some programs would want um, a letter of recommendation from the department chair at your med school. Some programs would want like at least two or three from, from, from a psychiatry, from a practicing psychiatrist. So having that all down will help you as you're assigning documents to a program. Um, visa sponsorship, if it's available, uh, applicable to you, because that will be really helpful in terms of ruling out the programs that you will or will not be able to apply to if, if, uh, if the visa is something that is a factor for you. Um, any previous experience at that program that you have, so you may know things about that program as well, any, any person that you know at that program who you may be able to reach out to. Um, and then likelihood, so likelihood of receiving an invitation to interview is something to consider, and you can write that there. For example, like three people from my school interviewed there last year, or like um, they have like a higher number of IMG applicants or, or, or matched residents, um, or these, this program has not been interviewing anybody. So just sort of like helps you um, prioritize in your mind and, and sort of like filter in your mind. But again, I put a star next to it because um, the likelihood of receiving an interview and an invitation to an interview shouldn't preclude you from applying to, again, those dream programs that you may have or those top tier programs that you really would want to train at um, as well. Um, in, in the last last couple of years, IRAS had made um, sort of like published some data about um, like a point of diminishing return. So basically, like what is the number of programs that you should really be applying to? So we'll talk about that, and, and I'll bring it back to the likelihood of receiving an invitation to interview uh, when we talk about it. Make notes in your Excel sheet about what um, what you're considering or what things you find on that program's web page, for example. Um, again, so that when you're applying or if you receive an interview, you have some notes for yourself. This could even include notes about like why you're not considering applying to that program. Um, again, so that when you're moving it into the into when you're building your list in ERAS, that it becomes an efficient process and you can double check from there as well. Um, strongly suggest color coding. Um, you can pick whatever colors you want to represent whatever, but um, examples of it could be like programs that you're not going to be applying to programs or programs that you definitely cannot apply to, for example, like they just don't offer the visa sponsorship that you need um, or programs that you will definitely apply to or programs that you're considering applying to, as well as color coding programs that you need more information from so that you can have them all kind of um, um, categorized together and you can reach out to them to kind of clarify those questions. And again, your notes or those um, different columns that you're going to make with the information about the program will help you determine what information you need from the program to be able to make like the best decision about applying to that program or not. Um, so once you've made your Excel sheet in um, um, of, of programs, in order to transfer it to ERAS, um, it's a four step process. So you have to search for programs. Um, once the program shows up, you have to kind of click that button to select it. You have to save it to your program list. Um, and then the third step that you have to do is you have to assign documents to each program and then finally apply to the program. I think this year you'll be able to start apply, um, sort of signing programs and applying on September 1st, but programs won't be reviewing it or be able to access it until September 29th. So you have this like 28 period of 28 day period of applying and sort of um, um, uh, applying to the programs and assigning documents um, available in the in the ERAS system. So information that is generally sent to all programs through ERAS, for my knowledge, is your ERAS application is general. It's sent to all programs. Your medical school transcript is sent to all programs. Your MSPE is sent to all programs. Your photo is sent to all programs. However, you do need to individually assign your U USMLE or complex transcripts your LORs and your personal statements. And you can make whatever combination you'd like. For example, you really want to go to a program that you worked at, you know that you work there, you know you want to write a very personalized email specifically to uh, uh, specific, uh, personalized personal statement specifically to that program. Just identify it so on your on your application and then you can you can assign a specific personal statement to a specific program as well or a specific combination of LORs. And again, your Excel sheet will come in really handy here because if that program requires like a chair letter uh, from that department from your medical school or requires like three psychiatrists that you work with letters or they require four or they allow you to have a fourth letter and you've got this great like four LORs that you really want, want them to get the best sort of idea about who you are as an applicant. Um, it'll help you sort of like assign LORs from there as well. 
And then once you've sort of assigned these documents, then you can start applying to the programs. Applying to programs, um, when we get to the application part, like a, a, I think a very common question is like, how many programs should I apply to? And the answer is that there's no like there's no magic number that you, there's no safe magic number that if you apply to this many programs you are definitely going to get um, uh, you're gonna it's gonna result in a match. Um, I talked about like the point of diminishing returns. So Iras made a to um, sort of like made a tool called Apply Smart a couple of years ago, which helped determine um, sort of the point of diminishing returns. For example, like if you what is the point after which adding more programs or applying to more programs does not result in a higher likelihood or significantly higher likelihood of matching? Um, from what I could gather, the the point for um, psychiatry programs about like 38.8. However, a caveat to keep in mind for that is it applied to like it was more about the U.S. graduates and not about IMGs. Um, and they have this sort of like listed down there is that it's it's because of the smaller number and sort of like more diverse profiles and smaller like number of people who match, it's harder to estimate that number for IMGs. Um, another critique that that if you're sort of thinking of looking at that tool, another crit critique to that um, tool is also that, that the number of programs that you apply to doesn't necessarily like guarantee um, how that you're gonna match. However, the number of programs that you receive an interview, the more the, the more programs that you're invited to interview for, and the more you interview, um, and your land quarter list of a specific specialty is um, a contiguous uh, specialty is um, the longer it is, the higher the likelihood that it's gonna result in in a, in a match, and the number for that is about between like I think eight and twenty, again for. Um, um, for US, but all, that that data does exist for IMGs as well. Um, so that's why sort of like considering or thinking about the likelihood that you may receive an invitation to an interview, like I mentioned before, may be a factor to consider. Um, so even though there's no magic number, it's also important to think about like cost for programs um, and applications. So um, usually applying to one between one to 10 programs costs 99 flat rate per specialty. So if you apply to 10 psychiatry programs, it's gonna cost you $99. But then when you go up to 11 to 20, it costs additional 16 each for programs and 21 to 30, 20 each, and then 31 and up causes 26 in each. This is per specialty. The transcript fee that's charged to apply to programs is $80, but that's one time per season. So if you apply to hundred programs, it's still gonna cost you $80 to, to send your USMLE transcripts. If you apply to 50, it's gonna cost the same. Um, and then the uh, the ERAS again offers like a residency calculator, so you can kind of like calculate costs um, of, of how much it's going to cost to apply um, to a specific number of programs. If you have like a specific number in mind, or for example, if you have a specific cost or budget in mind, uh, to sort of like calculate how many you can apply to. So um, the programs in ERAS, like one really great user guide to review is the My ERAS Residency User Guide. It really breaks down all of the application and all of the, um, the program assignment um, process into like little tables. So the, those four um, categories that I talked about, like saving programs, applying, to, um, um, searching for programs, saving programs to your list, assigning documents to them, and then applying to the program. It's really broken down um, um, in terms of like how many programs will appear in one search tab, et cetera, in the user guides. It's a really good user guide to review as well. Um, that's about it on, on sort of what we what to think about when you're selecting programs to apply to. Um, the next thing is like communicating with programs. So this could be for a number of reasons, and we'll talk about that um, next. So contacting programs, before you're contacting a program, like think of questions like, what, what do I need to communicate? Am I just communicating like for the sake of putting my name on their like email list? Or do I have like specific things that I need to communicate to them? Like things to think about, or for example, like reasons to, to communicate to programs, like you have a question, you do wanna clarify some criteria or program requirement or eligibility criteria. And this could be sort of like that from your Excel sheet that you made earlier where something is not clear and you really need to clarify something. Um, you want to make a case for yourself to ask for interview. And the little star next to it is because like, really think about it. Like, are you are you going to be making, everybody who's applying wants to make a case for themselves to interview and to be given an invitation to interview. If you have something specific to communicate, if you were writing a letter of intent, like really think about what do you want to communicate and what kind of case are you making for yourself? Do you need to write that email? And if you do, that's great. You should write that email. Is there something in, in, in addition to the application that you're sending that you need to send to the program? 
And then if you want to communicate something important to the program, um, it, it could be like important information. It could be an update about your application. For example, like you took step three, the result wasn't out yet. Now the result's out and you've now assigned um, the transcript to the program as well. And you really want them to review it. And that could be a great reason to communicate with the program as well. So if you've like, after answering these questions, you've thought about like, okay, I really need to pro contact a program. The next question is like, who should you contact? Um, the program coordinator is the best person to contact. Um, you can also, but if you have a question about like the um, the residency um, and or the residents or sort of like life during residency, uh, that you consider emailing the chief resident. That would be a, somebody to contact as well. And then um, when you're emailing, um, think about like, do I need to CC the program director on this or not? Like writing to the program director incessantly is not a good idea, um, especially if you have a question about that. That could be answered by by um, the program coordinator as well or the chief resident. Um, but if you want to just CC the program director so they, they know that the, that this is this is an applicant who's writing to our program with this specific email or this specific question, that might be okay. But I, I think I'm I left a question mark there because. I'll leave it to the program directors in our um, in our webinar to answer that question. And then, writing an email to them, I really recommend writing um, a personalized email to them, providing information, and it should be like a well-researched email and making sure you're addressing it to the right programs. So if you're writing this generic email to all the programs that are in your Excel sheet and you're just asking about their criteria and you apply and you address it to the wrong program, I think it makes you look very careless and that's a very sloppy mistake to make. So make sure you're addressing it to the right program. You're providing information about yourself if you're really trying to like write a letter of intent. If you're asking questions, so then asking very clear questions so that they can answer it clearly as well. And then, you know, application time and the application cycle is a time that's very busy for programs as well so they probably be getting like 100 of these emails so you so you can you should follow up but not barrage them with emails and phone calls and start to like stalk these people about applying uh, about replying to you and then as you're writing the email another thing to note um, is that you have to have spell check all your emails Make sure there are no grammatical errors. If you found yourself chuckling at this slide, then that means you're paying attention and that's really good. Um, and have someone proofread your first draft of your application, uh, of your email or the first few emails that you're writing. So that again, sometimes you're so involved in that you might miss a few things. And so making sure that you're sort of covering some of those easy things to cover, but also like if you're writing a letter of intent or you're writing sort of like to clarify a question, having somebody proofread it to make sure that it's really coming across, it's, it's putting the point across that you wanted to put across would be a good idea. Um, that's mostly all that I had. Um, thank you. I'm going to pass it um, pass it on, on to um, Dr. Zishan and, and Dr. Hamid. I'm going to stop my share. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khalid. Uh, I mean, very concise, very uh, great presentation. And uh, so now I will request Dr. Ahmed Hamid. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, who is uh, Associate Professor um, and Vice Chair of Education and Residency Training Director at Penn State Hershey. Um, very well known. Uh, you know, a lot of people are texting me that, you know, who interviewed with him because no matter you interviewed with Dr. Hamid 10 years ago, that impression somehow just stands in your mind because he really connects with you. I mean, at personal level, no matter what's your background is. So I'm receiving a lot of texts that to say regards to you that people really appreciate, you know, the experience. I mean, I can share mine. He even dropped us to the train station, the whole group with his own car. So really appreciate his humbleness, his generosity and his kindness and always willing to help. So thank you so much, sir, for joining us and please uh, share your thoughts. And thank you very much, Zishan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khaled and Dr. Khan for coming and joining us. It's an honor. Uh, anytime that uh, uh, we could sit down and help each other, I, I think uh, that is our responsibility and it's a blessing. Um, so I'll, I, I know we have not a lot of time, so I'll, I'll stay focused and would give very quick answers and comments um, and would not be long-winded. Long uh, Dr. Khaled had a wonderful presentation. Uh, let me start with following things. There are very good chances that uh, the interview season for residency would be a virtual season. They have not announced, but this is what's going to happen. 
and the programs and the GMEs are preparing for that. Uh, for um, majority of the institutions, it would be all virtual um, interviews. So be very mindful of that. Another tip that I would like to share with all, as all of you are on Zoom, I think the platform that would be used most probably would be Zoom with something else too, but again, that's there. Be very mindful that your name as it appears should be appropriate. First name spelled correctly, last name spelled correctly in the right uh, text and capitals. You should not be using my cell phone or something else your pictures, if they are there, need to be professional pictures. You should not be showing a picture of you snowboarding or sitting on the beach with, 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 with a glass of tequila in your hand. Be very mindful. That's the first impression that you are going to um, share with the folks who are interacting with you. Uh, the residency websites, uh, as this is going to be a virtual process, uh, there are about 300 plus programs in psychiatry, uh, general psychiatry that would be coming into the match season. Um, majority of the programs have very good websites and have all the information on their website. So uh, as Dr. Khaled uh, mentioned, if you're going to communicate with them, do not ask a question which is already on their website and repeating it because it comes across as a generic email coming in without you putting an effort of reading uh, the program's website. It, it, it just shows that, again, it's a blast email that you sent out and uh, you, you didn't think through. So it's, it's very put offing for the program or whosoever is reading it. Um, different programs, as I've mentioned, 300 plus programs, different programs have different rules. Some do not entertain any emails coming in and it just comes and they don't respond. Others uh, respond. Uh, and again, um, it's also the volume. Uh, last year, there were about 1,950 positions that went into the match. Out of those 900, um, 1,950, I think three or four were unmatched, which went into post-match. Everything else was matched. Uh, out of these positions, there were about maybe 325 plus minus positions which went to international medical graduates or so. So this, these are the numbers that uh, happened last year in the match. So, so be mindful. So if you are contacting the program, um, be very clear on why you're contacting, what's the reason. For example, if something happened with the ERA, uh, ERA system and your application was not in there or some letters got missed or you added new letters or your scores came back, something to the effect, do notify. But again, uh, uh, asking them how many positions they have in the match is already on the website. So, so, so be very careful with that. Website would also have... Um, uh, the visa that they offer. This is this is very specific for international medical graduates, the visa that they offer. Absolutely, it's clear. Um, so emailing them and saying, what kind of visa you offer is, is, uh, is, is a waste of your email. Um, they are offering two visas, J1 and H1. Majority of the university programs will only offer J1 for residencies, will not offer H1. So if you're looking for an H1, uh, if you have an H1, you want to extend it, or if you're looking for an H1, look at the programs which are offering H1 and then make your list uh, accordingly. Be very mindful. Be mindful of the scores. I always say it so. Scores are important. They are generally a range would be written on the website. So figure out where you fall and which programs you're going to use. Uh, Dr. Kiran uh, Khaled is absolutely right. Having some kind of a spreadsheet and going through that would be very helpful because you're, there are very good chances that you're not going to apply to five, 10 programs. It would be much more than that and keeping a track on what you are doing and who you have contacted or not contacted would be important because it would also look very redundant if you are sending a program, same email two, three times asking the same question, it looks unprofessional and, and looks um, clumsy. It, it, it doesn't uh, 
um, imagine yourself, if I asked you the same question five times, how would you feel? So uh, in, in, in the programs, they are looking at thousands and thousands of candidates coming in. So a person asking the same question five times does not reflect well on that particular individual. Um, um, emails, uh, yes, you can uh, and do um, uh, ask around. I think you guys have a lot of uh, groups uh, that are applying, uh, get information from them, talk to each other. That, that's a good resource that can guide you, your seniors can guide you, and then move through with the process. Yes, it's an anxiety provoking process, um, but it works out, everybody has to go, go through it, we went through it, you're gonna go through it, and it would work out at the end. But do it smartly, do it efficiently. There is a cost involved too. Um, I think the numbers go up at the more applications you, you, you send out. So be very strategic. Um, Dr. Khaled is all, uh, absolutely, I agree with you. So there are some uh, dream programs there are uh, that, that you want to apply to, but make sure you fulfill their criteria prior, prior to applying to that. Because again, uh, for example, if they are not offering a visa and you have contacted them and they have said, we are not offering a visa and you still apply, you're wasting money because they are not going to look at your application because that's, that is not what they do. And uh, there was a question, what is the percentage of uh, uh, IMG that should be in a program or shouldn't be in a program? That changes from year to year. But as I've said, uh, 1,950 slots, 325 or so were IMG. So you do the calculation and see uh, how many IMGs are in a program. But if a program has IMGs, whether they are more, less, or whatever, that sends a signal that they do take IMGs. And if you're a good, strong candidate, they will they will at least offer you an interview and then whatever happens in the match happens in the match. With that, uh, one last thing, there, there was a string going on uh, with regards to moonlighting. Uh, let me just uh, answer that question. If you are on a visa, you cannot moonlight. It's, it's very, very clear. You cannot moonlight, period. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, there is internal moonlighting opportunities. Now, again, there are there is an official answer and there is an unofficial answer. Official answer is ACGME does not want and majority of the GME offices do not want their residents a moonlighting within their, within their institution. So it's, it's, it's considered non-kosher. Sometimes it does happen, but again, bottom line is if you are on a visa, you cannot moonlight any place but on rare occasions within your institution, you can't do it outside because again, it requires an, an ECM, ECFMG to be notified of that place and it's it's a different thing. And with that, I will stop. No, thank you so much, Dr. Hamid. I think your answers are very pertinent and very focused towards the questions that are being asked. So before I were invite Dr. Asif Khan, I would like to acknowledge to of people who uh, joined. First, Professor Dr. Wakar Azim, just want to thank you. Uh, he's a mentor to many of us who joined us despite his busy schedule. And I would also acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. Harun Durani, who is the president-elect APNA, has been very involved in young physicians, their education. So thank you, both of you, for your presence, who really value your time on the weekend. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Asif Khan, who is um, Assistant uh, Professor uh, of Psychiatry and also the Associate uh, Training Director um, in Central Michigan University College of Medicine. Um, and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for joining. Please uh, um, go ahead and share your thoughts. Thank you, Lishan and Dr. Khalid for inviting us. And thank you all uh, for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Uh, Khalid and uh, Dr. Hamid has, I think, addressed most of the things that are pertinent and quite comprehensively. So there will be too little to add, to be honest, and it will be more focusing on some of the questions. I would completely agree with being organized. The process is demanding, particularly if you are an IMG, right? So the more organized you are, as uh, we mentioned in the PowerPoint, that you have your list, you have your color coding or numbers, whatever suits you, so that you can glance it and move on. Because as you move on, uh, 
with the process, you'll become more and more busy, right? If you start getting interviews, you start preparing yourself in that. So um, that's a very important point. Uh, Dr. Hamid mentioned and kind of alluded uh, to it very well about contacting the programs and emailing and everything. And I would just like to add, when you're typing that email to whoever, let's say, you know, it's, a, it's an open debate, who are you going to email to? And, you know, there is no hard and objective answer to anything. Whatever worked for someone else 10 years ago may not work for you or whatever did not work for somebody two years ago may work for you, right? So it's an individual experience, I would say, and you weigh and risk the benefits of what you're doing, right? So if you are sending out that email and that has some like errors, right? Whether it's grammatical or some other things, or maybe you are kind of addressing it to a blanket, uh, Mr. John Smith, right? And that person's name is not Mr. John Smith, then you're actually kind of, you're out. I mean, of that particular program. So be very careful in who and what you are, you know, communicating. Be always up to the point and very well said. Do not repeat because, you know, the application season is very busy for the programs as well. You know, there are people who are clinicians, there are people who are working, there are people who now have to do on top of everything, all the screening and everything. So be precise and be pertinent uh, in what you're talking to and what you're actually asking, right? Um, totally agree on the moonlighting is, so, I mean, you know, um, it's something I personally would not dwell too much about when I am an IMG and looking for a program, but that is my opinion. Again, once you get in, things can, you know, happen and things can change and we'll see where the, uh, where the protocols are, where Dr. I mean, kind of uh, Ahmed mentioned very, you know, kind of openly that maybe with the visa requirement, the, um, the possibility of moonlighting are pretty thin except for the own program. And uh, that's uh, pretty true uh, and accurate. So I would not kind of add anything else. There were a few questions going on about like, you know, and I know we've been through this process and, you know, we want an objective answer of, well, my address will make a difference. Would I do a residency like a research versus a step three? And, um, you know, let me be very clear, there is no clear cut answer to any of these questions. Now, if your application is so competitive and your address is listed in, I mean, XYZ country, would that make a difference? In my opinion, no, right? Now, there may be some programs who are literally looking for, based on their criteria for local applicants, for example, affiliation with the local geographical region, for example, a particular state. In that case, would it have some benefit? Maybe slight. If you are from that state and you have a strong application, then for sure, yes. But never forget, these are minor things. Your application is the key. Uh, your competitiveness is the bulk. I mean, kind of that you should be looking at. So I think those were the few points after all that comprehensive conversation that I could add, and I'll be open to any questions and, um, I mean, if they may arise. Uh, um, Dr. Khan, thank you very much. I just would like to add on the email um, a few things. Number one, uh, Dr. Khan is absolutely right. Personalize the email. Um, we see it every year, and I'm repeating myself because I repeat it every time I'm given this opportunity. We get bulk emails with different text in the same email, which tells us that it was coming as a bulk email and somebody just changed the name on top. And it's, it's, it's gone out to 100 programs. So don't do that. Keep the email um, um, personal and make sure the text, the font is the same. And if you can personalize it, it would be, it would be of value. One. Two, um, Dr. Khan is absolutely right. And I think um, Dr. Zeeshan, uh, uh, Dr. Khan, uh, I'm not sure about Dr. Khaled. We are on Adpert uh, uh, list. And there was, Adpert is, uh, 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 an organization of psychiatry program directors, associate directors, fellowship directors in United States. Um, and uh, um, there was a list, uh, there was an email going on, which was okay. 
what kind of candidate are we looking at do do we have do we use objective measures is it subjective to um for us to ask them to come in to the interview i can tell you there are handful of programs which are very objective everybody goes in on a spreadsheet numbers are assigned and they then they figure out who is doing what and then they invite but majority of the programs are looking at at the candidate holistically overall so many different uh, things uh, uh, account and that is also our experience too we could have two individuals with virtually similar resume one gets an invite other does not uh, another person gets five interviews and the other person only gets one the one with one interview ends up matching and one with 10 interviews does not match so again um uh, it's very difficult to say what worked or what did not work so it's it's difficult to answer such question whether step 3 would carry more weight than research most important thing is it's a two step process number one you need to get an invitation uh, for an interview number two in the interview process you need to do well so you can move up on the rank or list and there are one step at a time they 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 don't run parallel you can't do a good interview if you're not invited so be mindful of that no thank you so much uh, uh, dr hamid and dr khan i think one thing i really appreciate both of you is you know very concrete and very direct answer because sometimes our applicant they don't get it unless they get the you know the concrete answers so that's one thing but definitely i can you know share as an applicant you know their anxiety you know because they are in so many platforms someone is saying i got match because i have the highest scores i got match because i have ten interviews so definitely you are listening all those things but i hope you know listening from a program directors training directors faculty um and and listening this you know that you are unique in yourself you know yes all those things matter but what matter the most is what you can do and what make more sense in your uh, you know in 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 your scenario so keep listening you know keep listening but i think uh, that's why you know i'm really passionate and i'm really grateful my colleagues all people who are doing this webinar where we can answer all these queries which has been going on in your head uh you know and and you have been listening from different applicants from different mentors so i hope you know this has been helpful so i know we have a lot of questions were being answered very well very well organized so thank you for our panelists so before i ask uh, you know i think what i would suggest is um, that maybe raise hand but before i go that route i will request uh, uh in an order dr professor wakar azim followed by dr manal khan and dr fozia rain to comment to see if we miss anything on the question or anything they would like to add and we appreciate your time thank you yes dr wakar azim if you are uh thank you zishan uh, first of all very well done i think uh, all the panelists cover everything i don't have much to add only thing i will just reiterate um what dr hamid was saying two step process i think the interview is probably the most important once you are there that is the most important so go very well prepared how you dress up and you should look at usually people get the uh, names of who will be interviewing look at the programs very carefully look at all the people who you will be interviewing with very carefully google them look at the program very carefully look at the city very carefully be pleasant be collegial always treat the residents and the coordinators and anybody who is non physician also very well don't think it's just the people who are in authority you should be uh, dealing with nicely you should be dealing with nicely with everybody you interact anywhere in the hospital institution from the time you check in from the time you check out and afterwards you should send the thank you email or in the past you used to send the cards but it's important like might been 48 to send to our send something acknowledging and try not to do a generic email try to mention something which was particular to that program don't do generic emails uh, that we don't like i will just add something about moonlighting i will talk about myself i know for a lot of people uh, financial thing is important for some program director like me 
that kind of question is very irritating that people think about money before even starting the residency. Although I know some people have needs, but for some program directors, that question can be very irritating asking about moonlighting when you are applying for residency. So I think that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, thank you so, so much, Professor Dr. Karazin. Uh, and again, thank you for being, I think one thing, you know, I really like and I really appreciate, you know, the direct comments because uh, somehow our applicant, they, they just need a direct answer. Unless you tell them, please, no, this is not allowed. This is irritating to the training director. It's hard for them to get it. So thank you so much. I know you have been on family vacation and, uh, you know, and despite this, you were able to join. So really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dr. Manal Khan, who is our chair of residency committee, she was, she was our chief resident and now a fellow at, uh, at UCLA. So if she can add something, if we miss anything in the question, if you would like to add something. No, I think everything has been covered. And I think all the important things have been emphasized upon that, you know, don't ask uh, questions that can be easily Googled, personalize their emails, don't make them generic. So all of that is important. One thing that I will, um, and sorry, I had to kind of leave during Kiran's presentation, so I, I don't know if this point was covered, but I'm guessing this point was covered. The um, one thing that I will kind of emphasize on is that do apply. My, my thing always is that do apply to some dream programs if you have the means. If you're not restricted by resources, and as Dr. Hamid uh, pointed out, that if you fulfill the criteria, if you have the means, don't take yourself out of the race before the race has even started. Because I can tell you from my personal experience, I was told repeatedly to the programs that I have applied for, or the, to the programs that I have done my residency and fellowship in, that they don't take IMGs. Don't apply to these programs that they don't take IMGs. But in my experience, that has not panned out to be always true because you don't know who, will they, who they will end up taking. So at least don't take yourself out of the race before the race has even started. This is your one shot. You shouldn't have regrets. You shouldn't have regrets like, if only I had applied to that program, maybe I would have matched there. That should not be a lingering question that lurks in your heart 20 years from now or something. So just apply to those programs, get over with it. Um, that would be my only thing. If you have the resources and if you have, uh, if you fulfill, fulfill the criteria, but also have a large pool of programs that are solid, good programs that take IMGs, programs that are backup programs. So have a good pool of those programs as well. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Manal Khan, uh, for sharing that. And I can definitely reiterate. And Dr. Khan is a uh, really uh, example and a role model. I think she did her, you know, residency Duke and then followed went to UW. I think I don't, I don't believe the UW University of Washington have had IMG for a while. And now because of her great work, leadership, and you know, uh, I think they are looking, you know, or opening to explore that idea. So, and I know Dr. Khan is at UCL again, a very prestigious program. So yes. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. Now I would like to invite Dr. Fauzi Arai, who is our chair of media committee, have been very much involved in mentoring a lot of trainees, really appreciate her time and efforts. So Dr. Rai, anything we missed in the question, anything you would like to add briefly before we go to open question and answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zishan, uh, for inviting. Uh, I think it was a wonderful presentation by Dr. Khan. Um, and uh, uh, I think this is first time we have addressed this issue. Last year, we were not able to address this issue. And in the end, we were getting so many texts and people were asking us. So this was uh, really well done. And in the end, I know everyone will be coming uh, uh, to these questions and whatever Dr. Khan, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Khalid has told, they will be coming to. I have a few questions, um, especially from uh, Dr. Um, Hamid and uh, Dr. Khan, that is there, uh, I'm sorry if I have missed this, uh, is there some, I mean, uh, average number of programs in psychiatry that we should be applying? Because this is the question that applicants always ask that, what should be the average number of programs that we should be applying to? Uh, Asya, if you want to go first. Um, no, please. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I can always follow you. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Rai, I think uh, Kiran mentioned that for uh, uh, um, AMGs, uh, it ranges somewhere between 20 to 30 programs. That what what they go with. Kenan, you can chime in. What was the average? 30 something? 31? Yep. 
38.8. So this is for the American um, AMG candidates. That's the data that we get through the NRMP. Um, as far as the IMGs are concerned, I think you should start with, depending on the strength of your application, you should start with X number, which is financially viable, and then add more to it depending on, uh, on the interview calls that you receive. Generally, what ends up happening is if AMGs are applying to X number of programs, 30 plus programs, IMGs generally end up applying to same or more. It's actually more rather than same. So, but it's also a, a, a very significant financial commitment. And what we see at the end is that uh, the international medical um, graduates at the tail end of the interview season or somewhere in the middle of the interview season when interview calls are going out, whether they are getting it or not getting it, the number of applications uh, end up, they end up applying to more programs to even out the odds. I would also like to add uh, something that uh, uh, Manal said. I would divide the programs into three categories, dream programs, realistic programs, and backup programs. If you have that and you have a certain percentage in each category, you can go for it. But again, be very strategic about it. It's, it's a very strategic game that you have to play. Thank you. Um, anything else, Doctor? Before? Yeah. So, um, um, Doctor Hamid, thank you. But uh, what I have seen, again, I will uh, continue on this question because this is the question that everyone asks: that oh, how many programs it should be? How, because in the end, everyone is getting panicked. So, what I will um, share that in my experience, what I have seen, seventy to hundred program. I have seen. I have seen in my experience that everyone is applying to 70 to 100 programs, uh, the IMGs especially. And uh, the dream programs, everyone keeps five to 10 programs. It depends on your pocket that uh, 